Hello, everyone. Good evening. And uh, it's my pleasure today to welcome Vaibhav Srivastav, uh, who works as a data scientist with Deloitte. And he will be talking to us about building petabyte scale machine learning models. So on to you, Vaibhav. All right. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, today, I'm going to be talking to you about machine learning models uh, with Python. Right, let me just quickly switch to where my screen is. Yeah, uh, before I get started, first of all, thank you so much uh, to the Berlin Buzzwords um, Organizing Committee. I know that the, that the times are not that great and uh, for um, you know pulling through this uh, online conference, um, it's amazing, thank you so much. Hope I'm able to, to justify my presence here. Um, now, let me just give a quick walkthrough of, of who I am. Um, I'm a data scientist, I work with Deloitte Consulting uh, here in India, which means that right now it's 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 11 40, 41 p.m. my time, uh, and I architect machine learning workflows and products for Fortune Technology 10 clients on Google Cloud. Um, I've been I've been working in the realm of data, data science, machine learning for about uh, five to six years now, and 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 have been building um, large scale machine learning workflows for all these clients. Right um, now, enough about me. Um, let's talk about the agenda. Right. So, what I'm going to be talking about today with you all is, first of all, why do we need distribu distributed machine learning? Right. I mean, all the code that you put out on your laptops works works fine. Right. So, what's the specific need of distributed machine learning within that realm? Wh what is out of core machine learning? Right. Uh, then we we're, we're, we're going to do a bit of um, um, deep dive in terms of how do we build a scalable machine learning workflow. Um, and then as, as they always say that no talk is good without code. So we're gonna do a bit of code walkthrough about how you can build scalable machine learning workflows, uh, workflows with, with Dusk and with TensorFlow and uh, give you ready to use code snippets which, which, which you can leverage in your um, you know, uh, experiments uh, at your work or for your projects and so on, right? Then we're gonna try and answer the, the question of which one should you use. Um, since we're going to be talking about two approaches, and then we're going to head for question and answers. Um, all right. Without further ado, now before we uh, we we get into why do we need distributed machine learning, um, let's let's do a quick walkthrough of of what machine learning is, right? So, in a typical machine learning example, you would have some data, right? For this particular use case, let's let's take the example of um, predicting whether a person has their mask on or not, right? So my so my data. Would, would basically be images of people who would have their mask on or who would not have their mask on, right? And uh, so I, I basically have two classes and given a person going through my lab, uh, through my camera, I want to predict whether they have their mask on. So my, so my task is a classification task. I want to classify whether they have their mask on or not, right? And I have some images for that. Now, what I'll do is I'll, I'll uh, like in a typical machine learning task, I'll build a machine learning model for it. And I'll build a model for it. It can be, uh, it can be a linear model, can be a Bayesian model, can be a um, you know um, uh, can be a neural network, can be a non-linear model, can 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 pretty much be anything. Pick your favorite model for this, right? Um, then the next part of of that machine learning workflow would would be defining a loss function, right? Um, what this loss function typically would do is it would define the quality or or like how accurate your 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 model is at a given point of time, right? And um, and that can be um, through when it's searching into the uh, into into the space of all of your data to find the exact equation which which defines your your data uh, to its labels, right? And uh, last but not the least comes the optimization um, um, comes the op op optimization procedure, right? So in this particular case, what we'll do is we we'll optimize on minimizing the loss. So the minimum the loss, the 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 better by model would be. Now uh, we haven't touched distributed machine learning up until now, but this is how your basic machine learning workflow look like, uh, looks like, right? So you'll have some data, you'll have a task. It can be classification, regression. You'll have a model, um, you know, trying to do that task. You'll you'll have some sort of a loss function, um, which which would help your model converge to the best possible or or, or the most accurate model uh, that it can be given the hyperparameters that you define for it, and then a uh, then an optimization procedure to get to that. Um, to, to get to that global minima in the um, in the fastest possible time, right? Um, now, um, this was all 
this was all 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 fine right uh, we had um, uh, we 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 have my machine learning workflow and this works fine on my laptop this works fine on my virtual machine uh, but why do i need distributed machine learning right um that's where these three components come in right uh, typically you would need distributed machine learning when uh, you have massive data scale right so um, building a machine learning model on say an iris data set which has about 200 odd rows uh, is quite easy on your laptops or your workstation right because it can easily fit in your ram right and and you can easily build your model on your ram itself right but what if you're dealing with a different problem so for example if we if we, if we take our uh, example further what if you have images of people from uh, uh, from airports from uh, metro stations from the uh, on on the streets and you're trying to predict whether they have their mask on or not right that can be terabytes of data but that data would not fit on your particular uh, laptop or on a, on your particular machine learning cluster right because you've got huge data scale so um, typically when you have large data scale that's when that's when you need distributed machine learning right uh, second is uh, massive model scales, right? So ever since the um, the, the VGG16 model in, in image or the GPT models in NLP, um, there's like almost every other week or almost every other month, you would see that that the scale of the, of the or, or rather the size of the machine learning model has been increasing drastically, right? In fact, a couple of weeks back, uh, OpenAI released their GPT-3 um, um, language model, uh, which which has 3.7 billion parameters, right? I mean, that model would not fit in in like a uh, in your memory itself just for inference, let alone be able to train or like you know fine tune it further. So, uh, typically, when you when you're dealing with large model architectures or large uh, neural networks, um, for you to be able to train those, you need a distributed machine learning workflow, right? Um, third is is there something which is applicable across the board, right? So this is something that you would need for uh, for efficient computation of your algorithms, right? So say for example, if you're uh, building a neural network, right? So um, we all know that gradient descent for um, you know we we can use gradient descent for finding the best possible uh, parameters for your model, right? Uh, but that but that's a brute force approach, right? So that's going to take a lot of time, but Similarly, you can also use stochastic gradient descent, right? Uh, which is which is um, um, insanely fast and uh, manifold times better than uh, gradient descent in terms of getting the output. Fine, gradient descent would be accurate, but it's faster, right? So how can we make these algorithms um, efficient for their computation, right? Or rather, how how can we how do we be able to distribute the task itself for these algorithms for them to run as fast as possible? Right, so this is why we need distributed machine learning. Right now, uh, now that we know why we need distributed machine learning, let's talk about out of core ML. Right, so out of core ML, as the as the um, as the name suggests, it's it's basically machine learning, which um, machine learning which runs at a scale wherein your data is um, is is of higher um, order as compared to your um, core itself. Core meaning your RAM. So it's basically an algorithm which exploits your external storage that can be your hard disk uh, or your buffer um, buffer memory in order to support large data volumes that cannot be supported by primary memory right so now now let's let's spend a minute on this right um, what out of core ml in like a typical machine learning um, in like a typical machine learning world would would mean is that you take your data set in our case let's take the images of people whether they have their mask on or off uh, and you batch those images, right? You batch those images to, to to size which is just enough to fit in your RAM, right? In your in your primary memory itself, um, and then you then you take that data, right? And then you um, um, basically do a partial fit on your model, right? And then you you give your model more data and let it update its its um, its weights, uh, continually till the time you've exhausted all the data, right? That's what out of core ML is, and why it is novel. Or, or why it's useful is, um, say, for example, if you have a, um, a laptop which which has eight gigs of RAM, or if you have a virtual machine which has eight gigs of RAM, and your data size is 16 gigabytes, in that case as well, you can chunk your data in, in such a way, and you can create your feature engineering pipelines in such a way that um, you would not um, require to fit all the data in one go. That's why out of core ML is, is good. And we're going to be doing a deep dive of this later on. right? Um, now, 
going back to our going back to our example right how would this out of core ml fit into the example that we that we spoke about right um in the uh, in the in the use case that we were talking about um out of core ml would 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 look like something um wherein i i split my data into two partitions right so there is one data set partition one then there is a data set partition two right my task still remains the same which is to classify except now my data set has reduced and this is being operated on two different nodes right which can communicate with each other again my model still remains the same this can be say for example for our image classification task we can assume it's a, it's a cnn type architecture for a for a model right um, now there's a there's a slight update in my architecture here what's changed is the loss function so if you see on the left side the loss function now um runs from i equal to 1 to m by 2 m by 2 is basically half of my data right similarly on the other side it runs from i equal to m by 2 plus 1 to m which is like half of the data set is at uh, this side and half the data set on the other side right and also what has happened is my optimization rule has also updated right so so what what's happened to my optimization rule now is that it basically optimizes on the loss of task 1 uh which has data set partition 1 and also for the loss of um, uh data set uh, partition 2 right and then it sums it up and 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 in that way because all of these are communicating with each other you can distribute the task across you know two nodes or three nodes or four nodes and still be able to get to the best possible solution um cool now that was that was a lot of theory jammed in 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 past 10 minutes right uh let's talk about how this would look like in real life right so there are there, there are two ways you can you can build out of core ml or or basically scalable scalable machine learning workflows right uh the first is by using incremental models right incremental models are are something which um, which support uh chunking of data right uh, in a in a typical scikit learn lingo you you would uh, basically do a partial fit on your model so this is basically your stochastic gradient descent regressor your random forest um your uh the the neural net uh within um the scikit-learn library and and couple more there's an exhaustive list if you search incremental models on scikit-learn you would find that in fact I'll, i'll i'll link it in the presentation as well so as soon as you find it you can get a list of all the scikit-learn compliant incremental models so what you'll have to do with with model dot partial fit is you'll have to create your custom logic which chunks your data into small small sizes and then feeds it into the into the model right and then with each pass the model will start learning about your behaviors of the data right so that's 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 kind of the most um, uh recommended way if you already have a machine learning workflow built in like a legacy fashion and you want to update it to work on more data more, um, you know like um on larger data set size um the second thing is is something which i generally recommend to people who are building new workflows now right or or starting a project from scratch is to build and define a graph based training flow right so uh, if you typically use tensorflow or pytorch or mxnet um or you know dask ml or or like any new deep learning library that that keeps on popping up every other week um what they would generally do is they would build a directed acyclic graph right of your entire data your pre processing jobs your um you know your your business rules and pretty much any functions any classes that you give it will create a graph out of it now what this graph does is it does not load everything into memory first right what it would do is it would save the references of your functions your classes your data itself your batches uh, your dictionaries whatever you you give into that graph right it would save the reference of it right and what it would do is it would take that graph and when it is executing and when it's at a particular node of execution then it would load those references into memory right so so in in that sense it is very easy to use these these graph based training jobs um um sorry uh to use these uh, to use these graph based training jobs uh and um, you know build your machine learning workflow and 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 it's 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 very easy to replicate the same flow on on multiple nodes so what we were talking about before you can have two nodes running the same graph object and then converge their results together right so um in just about a slide or two we're going to be doing a bit of code walk through of, of both of these approaches <clears throat> now uh, again i i spoke about these two scenarios uh, again i'm going to rush past through them scenario one is something where you already have a machine learning workflow probably written in scikit learn or a stats models um uh, you know job 
and scenario two is where you are building a new experiment flow from scratch. Like, how do you tackle these two scenarios? And, and you build a scalable machine learning workflow, which can um, take you um, and, and, and build a flow which can which is very much scalable and be able to take as much data as you throw at it. Um, so for the for the for the older um, for the older uh, or, or legacy machine learning workflows, um, my recommendation would be to use Dask. Dask is is, is again like a distributed analytics pipeline um, natively in Python, um, which is written natively in Python and, and helps you create batches of data. You can think of it as analogous to pandas, except this is scalable pandas, and it can uh, automatically help you in defining your optimization strategies, your data distribution strategies, and make it um, make it worthwhile um, and, and, and actually make it, make it faster for you to build models which are out of code, right? And Dask has, as with Pandas, Dask has very uh, very nice um, compatibility with scikit-learn and stats models and, and all of these packages. So you can uh, mix the two. You can use Dask for pre-processing your your uh, you know your data and then use scikit-learn to uh, build your models itself, right? Um, now comes now towards the deep learning model side. Um, you can use like my 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 personal favorite is, is TensorFlow, and we're going to be doing like a quick walkthrough of that as well. Um, in a bit, and uh, but I wouldn't restrict you to just TensorFlow. You can use TensorFlow, you can use MXNet, you can use PyTorch. All three of those have a very robust ecosystem, so feel free to use that, right? Um, all right, now enough talk. Let's 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 talk about some code, right? Um, let me just so um, just to, just a quick heads up. Um, all the code that I'm going to be walking through would are being uploaded as a Colab notebook, and you can access those notebooks uh, through the links given in the presentation. I'll try and, and share those on the Slack chat as well so that you can get access to it uh, as, as early as possible. Uh, but yeah, so you, you don't have to worry about um, taking screenshots and stuff like that. You can easily get access to those. So I actually have this open. Um, let's first talk about uh, building distributed training workflows with TensorFlow. So this is this is actually a collab notebook, and I uploaded it into into Kaggle kernels so that uh, you can actually get like the best sense of it. I would recommend you doing the same thing as well, uh, and uh, you know try and run this. Um, so cool. So um, when we talk about distributed training with TensorFlow, right? So TensorFlow natively provides you a couple of distribution strategies, right? So uh, um, these are these are neatly packed in TF .distribute .strategy API within TensorFlow, right? In this particular example, what we're going to be using is we're going to be using tf.distribute.mirrored strategy, right? Uh, now let's let, let's talk about this mirrored strategy for for half a minute here, right? So what mirrored strategy does is whatever TensorFlow code that you write, right, it would replicate it across all the GPUs or all the nodes that you have connected with your um, with with the node on which you're running, right? So it would replicate the same code that you're running on multiple machines, right? And then it would run those right on on different chunks of data, and then eventually uh, the the context manager would take all the outputs from these nodes and then give you the final output. That's how the distribution strategy works. If you're able to see my screen, you will um, I, I have the distributed training um, uh, TensorFlow guide open. Right, they, there are about six to ten different training strategies you can see here. There's multi-worker mirrored strategy. There's just mirror tra uh, strategy. There's TPU cluster resolver strategy, and so on. There are there are a lot of it. And you can also define your own strategy as well. So um, again, the link to this is, 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 is in the notebook. So you can um, easily check that out as well. All right, uh, I, I see that I have very less time left. So I'm just going to uh, zoom past this again. So what we're going to be doing here is using the mirrored TF or distribute mirrored strategy. We're going to be training a very simple Keras um, or, or TensorFlow 2.0 TF Keras model, right? And uh, we're going to be using a Fashion MNS dataset, right? For all those of you who do not know Fashion MNS dataset, this is something which Zolando Research came up with, and uh, this is basically um, set, uh, basically a dataset of 70,000 images, and um, um, there are 10 broad categories, right? These categories can be shirts, can be socks, can be belts, can be you know skirts, trousers, and so on and so forth. Right? You can look look it up like what all uh, categories are there. And uh, this is basically one step ahead the MNIST data set. Everyone uses MNIST data sets, but the clothing apparel one has has quite a lot of challenges associated with it. Right? So that's the data set that we're trying to do. 
where we're going to build like a classification image classification model um, hopefully a very simple model at that and uh, see how that uh, how, how that would look like in a typical um, um, sorry in a in a typical distributed fashion um, so the, the, here are my you know normal imports so i have my tensorflow data sets i have my tensorflow as tf um, <clears throat> you can see that i'm using tf uh, 2.2.0 um, then this this mnist data set is something which is already in the um, which is already in the tf data sets itself so we load that and uh, i define my distribution strategy here which is tf or distributed merit strategy right so again like um, note that what all is being added into like your typical tensorflow flow right so up until now from whatever way you would write a simple tensorflow pipeline the only thing that's added is a tf dot distribute dot merit strategy right <coughs> sorry um, then you set up your your input pipeline this is again uh, simple you you have your train uh, examples you have your test examples right and um, then you have a couple of like like a very simple pre processing um uh, pre processing step wherein you're you're essentially scaling your images uh, back to the scale of 0 to 1 and um, you can um, this this is being done by the scale function um then over here you're, you're essentially just applying that scale function using a map function and uh, we create a very simple model uh, another thing to note there is this new line added which is with strategy dot scope so uh, this tells my 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 tensorflow uh, directed asac like graph that all the model um, everything that's written within the model um, 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 everything that's dis de defined as as model is something which comes in the scope of my distributed strategy right so that's that that's something that's changed right and my model is quite simple i have a convolutional layer i have a max boning layer i have a flattening layer i have a dense layer and then i have a dense 10 layer because i have 10 classes right uh, you can see that analogous to our example my loss function is a sparse categorical cross entropy uh, um, loss and i'm using an atom optimizer so pretty much boilerplate code nothing 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 fancy here everything same the only thing that's been added is a strategy over here right and again i'm, I'm just defining these callbacks this is the the tensor board um, is something that i i don't think so works with with kaggle but when you run it on your own laptops this would run quite fine so you would be able to see all the losses the accuracy and the um and then all the other metrics that you define onto the tensor board itself then we define model checkpoint this is to save the model after every epoch uh, and we define a learning rate scheduler. Uh, this is basically to be able to uh, expedite the way I train my model. So I will have, uh, you know, uh, a higher learning rate at the start at, at like the first epoch, so that I can jump to um, to uh, to my global minima as fast as possible, and then I, I can reduce the learning rate. Right. So again, pretty much simple boilerplate code. You can you can see it here, and um, then we do train and evaluate. So this. Um, I've done this benchmark. When you run it on your laptop, right, on on like a very simple laptop, per epoch takes about a minute or two, right. But when I'm running on a distributed platform using the mirrored strategy, um, you can you can see that it's it's taking 18 seconds per epoch, uh, per uh, you know epoch, right. And let's not go into the accuracy and so on. It's 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 giving like 98.62 percent accuracy, but that's fine. That's that's more of like how the architecture is defined, and and so on, right. Um, Let's step ahead, and then you can see that uh, I have all my models kind of put into this checkpoint folder. So I have uh, my checkpoint one, two, three, four, five, six, all the way till nine, right? Um, and again, uh, since my model's already there, uh, I can quickly pick it up and load the model and also evaluate it, right? So up until now, I've I've already saved my model. I'm I'm, I'm able to load it, so you don't have to come up with some sort of fancy. Um, you know, uh, code because you you had distributed um, training environment. You don't have to change anything in your inference, right? Your inference still remains the same, right? And it it, it works out fine. However, um, uh, if 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 I go here, if you if you want to have like a like a distributed um, evaluation as well, right? You should you 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 can do the same thing with the same strategy, right? You define the same strategy scope, and you you would be able to get a um, you would be able to get a um, a distributed inference environment as well, right? So I know that I rushed through a lot of code, and again, I'm, I'm going to give the um, uh, I'm, I'm going to send the um, the link to this notebook out to you. Um, but yeah, this was just to showcase like how a, a very simple distributed strategy can be applied to your 
you know, normal TensorFlow code, with just two or three lines of code, you, you, you should be able to uh, build a highly scalable workflow um, without a lot of effort, right? Um, now, I know that I'm, I'm, I'm kind of pressed by time, but I'm going to do like a quick um, walkthrough of how the um, how the Dask um, process works like, right? Again, just a just a quick check, um, um, quick checkpoint here. Uh, what we're going to be doing in the so so again, let me take a step back. So in the TensorFlow example, what my 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 main aim of talking over there was that how do you build machine learning workflows uh, if you were to do if you were to solve say a deep learning um, ex problem, right? But what if you you have like a normal statistical problem, right? Uh, how would you uh, build a workflow for that? And earlier on, we decided that you know um, we, we kind of went through how Dask and Scikit-Learn kind of go with each other. So in this example, we're going to be talking about how Dask and XGBoost can kind of work together, right? So again, Dask, just a quick refresher, Dask is nothing but a large parallel data frame um, you know, library, and it, it sort of helps you, um, you know, build um, um, larger than memory, um, um, you know, larger than memory um, data frames and kind of help you in, in processing those, right? Um, these are all, all all the same imports. Just a quick thing again. So Dask gives like when you run the Dask code, it will give you like a nice dashboard. So you can see how your workers and cores and your memory is being utilized um, when you're running your Dask code as well. Right. Um, again, for this exercise, we're using the New York City taxi fare prediction. So essentially, it's it's a regression problem, and we're trying to predict the fare of a New York City taxi based on their um, based on multiple features like what is their um, source, what is their target, and so on. Um, now, just a quick check. If I was to talk about, uh, um, if I was to talk about um, using Dask, how would you be able to take a mean of first one thousand numbers in Dask? Um, that would be something like this. So you do, you create a NumPy array of np dot um, range one thousand or ten thousand, and um, you you basically put it into Dask using da dot from array. And you do y dot mean dot compute, right? And, and this is incredibly fast. You were able to get the uh, get the results in, in you know um, less than a second, right? Um, similarly, you can see that that there were about um, there were about um, um, five point five four, I think about fifty five million uh, rows, and it was able to uh, you know uh, get those into uh, into in, into our directory in about thirty five point seven seconds. Now let's try and load this into into my task data frame. For for about fifty five million <laughs> rows, pandas would just not work. You can see that I I have the pandas line here. This just did not work, right? My my kernel crashed, my computer crashed, and so on. So this would just not work. Pandas would just not be able to take this much memory in. But Dask was able to do it, right? In 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 just ninety point seven milliseconds, it was able to get all the references of data, and it was able to get this data in, right? Um, now again, over here we're, we're basically defining through the Dask data frame itself. We're defining what should be my train types, my test types, defining all of those. I'm defining my training columns. Um, my uh, you know um, I'm defining a bounding box in terms of you know where my uh, where my city is and um, uh, you know um, where my source is, where my destination is, and and so on, right? Um, and then I have a couple of functions in terms of uh, how do I load my data. So what all columns do I want to take? Um, what what fraction of those rows do I do I load? Do I load just two millions and so on? So we, you can configure all of this through. Um, and then we load the data, right? And uh, then you can see that um, the task data frame was able to get everything into a data frame and have all the fair amounts, what we have to predict. The date, time, the longitude, the latitude, uh, drop off, pick up, all of these these things are, are kind of in the Dask data frame itself, right? And, and again, I, I I I can't stress on this enough. Like being able to do this on a 55 mil row data set uh, in in like just a couple of seconds is 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 magical because if you were to do it in pandas, you would just not be able to do it, right? And then um, you basically create your uh, XGBoost model, and over here we're using um, XGBoost and and Dask XGBoost. And um, this is the same way that you build your model. And I see that there's an error. All right, I'm not going to get into the error right now, but I'll I'll fix it before I I I, I share this along with you. But um, um, essentially, 
using the same code and using just the XGBoost model, you would be able to create uh, a scalable uh, feature processing pipeline and be able to you know push it into XGBoost and and get results out of it. Now I have just one slide to um, to cover, so I'm just going to quickly head over back to my slides. Um, and again, both the both the code snippets are are on the um, are are on the links in the slides, and we can go through it. Now you may ask the question that which one should I use? Should I use the Dask Scikit-Learn combo, or should I use the TensorFlow uh, and and like the PyTorch one? The answer to that that is that there are actually no solutions. There are just trade-offs, right? So it, it depends on um, it depends on what your use case is, what your problem is. I, I personally use a lot of tasks I could learn combo. I also use TensorFlow for my deep learning work as well. But the way I, I define my distinction is that I, I use, whenever I have to build a simple scikit-learn model, I would use Dask along with scikit-learn to build those. But if I have to build something uh, which is probably with you, leverages image processing or natural image processing, I would build it in TensorFlow using tf.data. Um, with that, thank you so much. Um, I, I know I rushed through a lot of content, but I hope this was helpful to you. Uh, you can you can tweet out your questions to me at reach underscore vb on Twitter, and you can find more about my talks on the epic blog as well. Um, and if you have any questions, we can take those now. Great, thanks, for above. Uh, very interesting pointers and insights, uh, guys. If you have any questions, please ask in the Slack channel. Maybe we still have a couple of minutes. Uh, actually, I have a question myself. So, when you talk about trade-offs, so when we talk about um, you know distributing, let's say, machine learning workloads, so something we have been using is to use Spark. Uh, do you have some thoughts on how Spark compares with the Dask, or is it also it depends? No, so um, actually, actually, Spark is a very good um, option, right? Spark has very nice integra um, integrations with uh, with you know uh, Spark ML and uh, and 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 also with TensorFlow in in certain uh, silos, right? Uh, but but the reason where I digress from Spark is generally when you write a Spark code, right? Maybe in in PySpark or in Scala for your pre-processing and so on, it becomes quite clunky because. Whenever you're you're building your pipelines, you can find you can put it into production quite easily, right? But uh, its native interactions with quite a lot of um, you know um, uh, well built out libraries within Python, like um, you know PyTorch or with uh, MXNet and so on, becomes quite um, quite difficult, right? So you would you would have to introduce some middleware in between your Spark preprocessing pipeline and your model itself, right? So um, again, I, I a lot of firms use Spark. For their machine learning models, and they put it as well. They also build Spark streaming jobs as well to put their models in streaming pipelines as well. But um, my 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 only problem with that is that it, it it becomes too clunky for you know one person to build something or just like a small team to build something out of. And plus, right. obviously, it, it adds like a lot of um, you know language issues as well. Like you write in Scala or you write in Java or you write in you know uh, Python or using PySpark, whatever. So yeah. So you would say Dask is more of a lightweight native kind of yes. uh, alternative. Yeah. So actually, Dask is being used by 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 a lot of um, organizations. So uh, DARPA uses it, which is the defense um, um, in 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 US. Um, a lot of um, um, you know aeronautical um, um, companies like NASA also use it, and also a lot of HPCs use it as well, like for for high performance computing. So it's picked up quite fast. And it's built from ground up in Python. So it's quite fast as well. Great. Thanks, Vibha. I don't. I guess we are a bit out of time, and I don't see any more questions. So guys, please feel free to reach out to Vibha over Slack or Brella. And uh, thanks again, Vibha. I guess it's a bit uh, late in your part. But uh, have a great evening, and keep in touch. Thanks. 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 Cheers.